All right, guys, welcome to another video from XF Motorsports. For this one, it's back to the E55 ASL, finally. And um, for this one, I'm going to be showing you guys how to make these rear wing mounts. I was pretty excited about this video, so I already did the whole mounts before even starting the intro for this one. But later on, after making these mounts and mounting these two elements on the wing, I will be taking this car to the racetrack, finding out if this wing made any difference on the track. And also, while well, later on, talking about some of the things that I need to improve on this wing, like adding carbon fiber elements and end fences and everything. But um, yeah, let's start off by showing you guys how to make these um, rear ring mounts and then get into all the rest of it. Here's a look at the material I'm using for making the rear ring mounts. It starts off as a flat piece of aluminum. This is 6061 aluminum. It's 19 millimeters thick, 2 feet in length and 13 inches wide. And um, you might say it's a small piece for making all this because if you put this uh, thing on top, you can see that it doesn't even really fit <laughs> on this whole thing. But um, the way I arranged it in the software, which you'll later see when I show you the design, it's um, I arranged it in a way that it could all be made in one shot from one piece of aluminum so that um, it saves cost that way. There's less wasted material. But let me first start off by showing you guys how I designed this rear wing. Then I will be clamping this piece onto the CNC machine onto the table so that it can be held in place. And then after that, I'm just going to be selecting Selecting all the cutting tools, putting them in the machine, um, calibrating the machine to those cutting tools and then finally feeding in all the G-code and then the machine is going to take over from there and basically give us this result. So for designing the rear wing I was using Fusion 360 and I basically, while the elements and some of these other things were already designed before, all I had to design this time was just these mounts, how to hold everything together. And I went with um, this design because this gave me a lot of adjustability. And yeah, basically once um, this whole mount was designed, the next part was to do a bit of simulation on it, make sure that it's strong enough. So I did change the design a bit as I went through the simulation, just making sure that it's um, actually strong enough to withstand the downforce and everything. So a few of the changes that I made later was right now this uh, top section was actually hollow, but um, on the actual wing later what you'll see is that this is actually filled so once the part was designed, the next step was actually figuring out how to make it. So I took all these sections of the rear wing mount and I placed it um, up, like in this shape over here, kind of like um, IKEA furniture. You try to package it in the smallest place possible just so that you can um, make most of it out of uh, less materials. These three things that I placed on the top and bottom were basically two of these are the bolting points that are going to hold this piece to the table and then these two things were alignment dowels so they're bigger in the design but actually they were really small um, so they are so that I can machine one side of the piece first then I can flip this piece over like this and then it will still line up on the same alignment dowels and it will make sure that everything still seems stays aligned to the same zero that is in the design. So showing you guys a quick simulation of um, how the machine is going to cut all this. It's going to first start off with a facing operation where it's going to um, basically yeah, make sure that the whole face of the thing is flat. Usually for this one you use a facing end mill which is a much bigger one. Uh, but I was just using a regular end mill just because, uh, well, to be honest, I just did this for the looks. I like the looks of like the small end mill, the machining patterns it leaves on the part. Anyways, after the facing operation, the next part was cutting these pockets. Uh, for these ones, it just went to like um, half the depth of the part because, of course, it's cutting the first half on this step and then the second half when I flip it over and then do the other side. Um, after that, it was time for like uh, making all these holes and these slots. After that, it was just um, yeah, time to like go around these parts and like separate them from the rest of the aluminum. And then the last step was uh, which it's on right now. I'll just slow it down at this part so you can see better. So it uses this um, ball nose end mill and it makes these contours at the end. For these contours, I could have also gone with a tapered end mill. Or actually, no, I couldn't have gone with the tapered end mill because there was also some radiuses over here. Um, so yeah, basically what I did was I took a ball nose end mill and ball nose is what you usually use for contours. But yeah, this is basically what the part is going to look like when one side is milled. So once everything was done in the software, it was on to putting the workpiece in the machine and um, clamping it down and then finding the zero of the uh, workpiece. So the zero, I was using it as the, the left upper edge of the part. So for finding this, I, I was just using an edge finder, but this is not a really accurate edge finder. This one was an electronic edge finder that blinks an LED light when it starts touching the aluminum. But I did not find this to be too accurate. I think the conventional... Uh, mechanical edge finders work way better than this one but anyways once zero was found the next thing I had to do was I had to drill a few holes in the workpiece so that I could uh, put the alignment dowels in place and also bolt it to the table 
Now another machine shop close by actually gave me a really helpful tip with this machine to put a secondary table on this table. So this uh, surface that you see on top is actually another aluminum plate that I made for this machine so that I could uh, basically drill holes anywhere in this and like tap holes and then bolt my work pieces to this so that I wasn't using the actual machine's table to do work. Um, this way if anything goes wrong or if any end mill or drill slips and goes too deep it's not drilling into the actual table it's just drilling into this table that I've put on top of the actual table. Once everything was done with putting the work piece in place, next I had to put all the cutting tools in place and whenever you're using multiple uh, cutting tools you will need to set the tool heights for all of them. So for this uh, I was using this micrometer thing that uh, the people actually that sold me this machine they gave uh, this with the machine and it actually came in really handy for setting tool heights because this is actually 50, 50 millimeters um, high and you just put it on top of your work piece and then you come down with each tool and you bring this thing to zero which means that uh, that tells you that your tool is exactly 50 millimeters away from your work piece and then using that you can actually set all your tool heights for all your tools. So now I've put all my tools in place, I've actually set all the tool heights and also the zero for the table so everything should be good to go now. I'm almost at the point where I'm ready to hit the play button and <laughs> this is the play button on the machine and then the G code will take over from there and the machine will do the rest. And hopefully if I've done everything correctly I should end up with the right piece by the end of the uh, entire G code. I'm going to be using this little camera to record everything that the machine is cutting for a time lapse but I'm not sure how well that's going to work out because I'm going to be using through spindle coolant so coolant is going to fly everywhere when uh, the machine is going to be cutting. I can't cut this without coolant because uh, this aluminum I've already tried it before cutting without coolant it welds the aluminum in no time at all that means that uh, the end mill gets so hot that it starts melting the aluminum rather than cutting the aluminum so but yeah, let's give it a try. Let's uh, um, press the green button on the machine and see what happens after that. So unfortunately this time you guys will not get to see too well what happened after that because my camera got flooded with all that flood coolant that I was using to cool the end mill. And yeah, the video quality was just horrible. After that I did place another camera on the outside of the machine looking in from the door, but that also didn't work because even the door got blasted with so much coolant that um, yeah, the camera just didn't focus on the right spot after that. Okay, so the part is finally complete. It took a time of 2 hours 55 minutes just to cut one side of this part, but that is because um, I decreased the feed rate in the middle to 30 because I just wanted to be safe. Um, realistically, I think I could have taken the feed rate all the way up to 100%, which is what I had in the software. Um, and that way I would have gotten quite less time like cutting this whole thing, but uh, yeah, this is what the part turned out. I haven't opened it yet. Let me just uh, open the doors and see how it looks like. Oh wow, this looks pretty good. Look at the uh, finish on the top. Uh, the finish on the sides, this is a little rough right now, but uh, I could have added a taper on it. That was one way to get rid of this rough finish. Or the second thing is I could have just done a finishing pass or um, done the roughing passes a little slower. but. Uh, I didn't want to do so slow because I'm just trying to like save as much time as possible with the machining, trying to go as quickly as possible. But other than that, this is actually a pretty good result. So next what I need to do is I need to unbolt this whole thing. I need to flip it over and then uh, bolt it back in the same place. Hopefully these alignment pins will make it stay in the exact same place. Well, close enough actually to the exact same place so that I can run the next code, which is for the uh, part flipped over. And then once that other side is milled, then all these pieces should fall out and then I will be able to use them. So that is it, now all the parts are separated from the rest of the aluminum and this program has actually only taken me 1 hour 42 minutes to run so it's significantly 
um, less time than the other one just by playing around with the feed rates and spindle speeds and everything so that's pretty amazing how much time I've been able to save. So now that all these parts are cut next what I need to do is I need to drill some holes in them so that I can actually um, put bolts in there where these uh, individual parts will actually hold the elements of the wing. Um, for drilling these holes though I have to mount these parts on the in the milling machine at a really awkward angle so for that I will need a vise, a precision vise actually. So right now what I was working on is um, I was planning to mount this vise uh, on the table but for this I will need to drill a few more holes in the table and also make a slot in the middle because how these precision vise work is that to make use of the precision in the vise you actually need to clamp it properly so they come with these two uh, things that get bolted at the bottom of the vise over here and the table also usually has grooves which these things are supposed to lock into but my table uh, my milling machine table I'll show you the grooves from the side actually so these are the grooves that the table usually has and then these things are supposed to like uh, go in here but for my milling machine of course this is not the right size because um, this milling machine is in millimeters whereas that vise is in inches so that's why the size doesn't really work out properly but that's no problem because um, I have this aluminum thing that is again going to come in handy. So what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to um, mill a groove in here that is the exact width of this, these two keys. And that way I will just bolt these keys at the bottom of the vise and I will leave them here. So every time I need to put the vise on it's just going to be as simple as lining it up with that groove. It's going to go in at that place. And then two holes over here to bolt the actual vise to the table. So it's going to be super easy to take the vise in and out. So after that was the painful part of milling into my own table or secondary table that was on top of the table and um, this was really important for me not to screw up because if I screwed up on this part I would have had to replace this entire table so I had to get everything right the first time but luckily the precision with these CNC machines is so amazing that you just program everything into it and all the bolting points all the clearances they match up exactly the first time so it makes things really easy in a way. After the vise was clamped in place it was time to put all these parts in one by one so that I could drill and tap them to where these uh, bolts for the elements would go. And once all that was done it was just a matter of bolting all these pieces on the car and doing my extremely accurate strength test making sure everything was strong enough to take the downforce. And after that yeah just uh, putting these elements on. Here's a look at the wing mounts after they are completed and mounted on the car. So everything is looking pretty good for the mounts, but everything is not looking good for the elements. Well, these are um, temporary fiberglass elements that we made in California while I was there um, at Carvajal Motors. So thanks to those guys, they actually did all the work and uh, made these for me. But um, now that I look at them, they're a little twisted and the slot gap doesn't really work out to be proper. That's why it's really going to be hard to use these ones properly. I'll have to replace them later with um, proper carbon fiber ones. Uh, anyways, I'm still going to test the car out like this with this wing mounted, see how much of a difference it makes at high speed. And um, because with, this, with these uh, mounts now I have a ton of adjustability, I can move this um, upper element individual from the lower element. The lower element is adjustable from over here. And also that little wing that is going to go there later on, um, that's also going to be adjustable. So a ton of adjustability, a ton of stuff to play with and um, find out what works best. <laughs> So now getting to the track day finally, this was the E55 ASL's first time on a track in Canada actually and it was on TMP Toronto Motorsports Park but this was, this was actually an open lapping day, this was not a time attack event or something so there were quite a lot of slower cars on the track so it was really difficult finding clean laps and um, it, it was not really an ideal day to go out for overall lap times but nonetheless it was amazing to be on a track finally where um, it had no 
weird California rules that you can't go above a certain noise level or you can't push the car or you get black flagged and you can't overtake without point by so you have to lug around driving behind some Honda Civic all day where you can't even get your tires up to temperature this was actually like a proper chance to push the car to the limit and like um, get the tires up to temperature really explore the limits of the car at least and well first off I think the biggest difference that I felt this time um, as opposed to before was that there was so much rear downforce just because of that rear wing before this um, the back end of the car used to feel like it was gonna fly off above a certain speed it was really not stable um, going above a certain speed but just by adding that rear wing you would be surprised at how big the difference was now I could easily floor the car take it easily above 200 kilometers per hour and it did not feel unstable at all um, even coming out of corner exits I could floor it completely out of corner exits and the back end would not slide and even when it would slide it was extremely predictable extremely controllable so it was a massive difference this rear wing made on the car and it, it made it so much easier to drive the car and um, drive it to the limit and drive it at high speeds and still not be afraid of pushing the car. Talking about the lap times though, there was only one lap that I got without traffic. The marshal over here, Mitch, he was really nice and he positioned me in a way that I wouldn't run into any traffic for that one lap. It was towards the end of the day and I knew that that was the only lap that I was going to find um, that I had a chance to set like a proper lap time but unfortunately the pressure kicked in. I pushed the car, I was trying to push the car a little too hard and I screwed up big time I it was a yeah it was a really horrible lap I hit a curve really hard and messed up my alignment at the rear so it's uh, I'll let you guys watch the lap anyways but uh, I, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll improve a lot as a driver from this point on though. Yeah, that was unfortunately the most horrible lap ever, but nonetheless the car did a 116.9 on that lap. That's, uh, in terms of lap time, that's pretty much what you expect from a Porsche 911 Turbo or something. So, um, even on the most horrible lap, the car is matching the pace of a good lap in a Porsche 911 Turbo or something. So, that is a pretty decent pace for this car, but the car should be faster than that. It's Looking at the telemetry, the numbers look amazing. It's actually going a lot faster down the streets than a Porsche 911 Turbo would. It's actually going faster in the corners than a 911 Turbo would. So, it should be, the lap times should be quite a lot, like 3 or 4 seconds faster than what the car is going right now. Um, that said, it's, I still have a lot of work to do to get the lap times there and I think um, that is going to be the biggest challenge um, for me learning to drive this car properly and um, not making all these amateur mistakes that I was making on this track day. Um, but I think with time I will probably improve and next time out I will hopefully be able to deliver a better result than this at least. Okay, so the E55 ASL is back from the track day and I'm truly surprised at how big of a difference this rear wing made on the track because um, before driving this car without the rear wing it was impossible to even floor this car in third gear. It just used to spin the rear wheels like crazy. Um, and even in fourth gear driving fast enough it just seemed like the back end was going to fly off above a certain speed. But just by adding this rear wing, even though it's not even complete right now, it has no end fences or um, even these elements are so flimsy right now, but just by adding these two elements at the back, the difference is amazing. I can actually floor this car in third gear in corner exits and everything and it just puts the power down. But of course it's not complete right now and there are a few things 
that I still need to do to it to make it complete. And of course the steps are that first of all I need to make proper elements for it. These elements were uh, temporary elements that um, this company in California, Carvajal Motors, made for me. And big thanks to them, they did do a proper job because I thought these elements were going to fly off after a certain speed because they just looked so like um, flimsy, but they did not fly off, even though in the video later on when I looked at them, they were flexing like crazy, like they were bending down all the way. And of course they would be, because according to the CFD numbers, I believe this rear wing was supposed to make um, 400 kilograms of downforce at 200 kilometers per hour. And well, it was going faster than 200 kilometers per hour, so there must have been a ridiculous amount of force on these elements. And the fact that they held up is alone pretty impressive. So my plan for making the carbon fiber elements for this wing is that, well, there's also been quite a lot of requests for people that want to buy, that want me to make rear wings for their cars. So what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to make like these standard molds for carbon fiber elements so that I can actually like make professional, really good looking carbon fiber. Um, so those elements are going to be standard. I'm going to be using the same elements on this car that I'm going to be making for like a production wing to sell to people. And the production wing, it's going to have like um, aluminum inserts on the side so that the end plates can be bolted on and also aluminum inserts in the middle where the wing mounts actually bolt to the wing. So it's going to be much more rigid than this one. It's going to have a foam core inside it and it's also going to be carbon fiber. So it's going to be lighter and yeah, stronger than this one. So it won't flex around on the track as much and um, it's going to handle quite a lot of downforce. So even at 300 kilometers per hour making like a thousand kilograms of downforce, it would be able to support that. The wing mounts for the production rear wing are also going to change a bit. For the production version, I'm going to be doing the extra steps, making proper fixtures for the mounts and everything. Since I'm going to be making more than one, it makes sense doing all those extra steps. So the quality would be way better. Um, the design, I'm going to improve it a bit. And also there has been a few requests that people want adju electrically adjustable rear wings, that they want the top element to open and close. Um, just like I did on my E55 before. Well, that was a three element wing, but uh, I'm planning to make a production wing that is also going to have that feature, like you can electrically open it and close it. And actually that's not the only thing that I'm going to be making on the CNC machine because um, just to show you guys, there's another box that has come over here all the way from the United States. It's a transmission actually, and it's a 350Z transmission. And the person is also sending his E55 really soon from the States. And he wants me to do the exact same swap that I did on this car, like an M113K engine along with the 350Z transmission. He wants me to do that on his E55. So I'm going to be making billet aluminum adapter for the swap as well so that other people will just be able to bolt that adapter onto their cars and make this whole swap work because it is an amazing swap like driving this car with this transmission it's it feels amazing like the gear ratios everything is right on it's it's definitely the right transmission for this engine so that is going to be everything for this video i really do need to get back to work because there are quite a few orders for this machine stacked up that i need to make for people and also other than that i will also be making production parts that um, i will also probably do videos on and also list on my website that um, you guys will be able to buy that I will be making on this machine things like rear wings later on I'm also planning to make um, pistons and connecting rods and also transmission adapters there's been quite a lot of requests of different transmission adapters that people want me to make so I really need to get back to work and pick up the pace so that I can actually make all those things if you have any custom parts that you want to get made I will link the website down in the description below or you can also email me at info at xfmotorsports.com but yeah this is going to be everything for now I need to get back to work I will see you guys in the next one.